Hey guys, OG Albina here, bringing you guys a new series to the channel, um, something that was suggested to me by um, someone else that I thought would be a really cool idea, and it's going to be Draft League Replay Analysis. Um, so what's basically going to happen is I have this Google form open. Um, I'll link it in the description below. If you guys didn't see our community post or our Twitter post or any post in the Discord, which by the way, you should you know, check out all three of those things. Um, they'll all be linked in the description. Um, but basically what I'll be doing is I'm going to have people submit replays to me, submit their team, submit the matchup as well, and then, um, you know, their name if they want to know, you know, people that know who this is, and um, any unique rule sets or anything like that that happens to, you know, go along with the match. And what I'll be doing is I will be analyzing the game, talking about what they did well, what they did not so well, their build, the matchup, and things like that. This isn't really a series for you to submit you having your best games right and i don't necessarily mean send me your six o's if you feel comfortable sending me your six o's you could do so but send me close games where you know one or two things might have gone wrong or you don't know exactly where you went wrong why you lost this game 3-0 and you thought that you were in a good position and then bam the game was lost things like that um i'm not the best player in the world i i, I don't claim to do that and i a lot of things i say in this could even be you know incorrect but i think i am a pretty solid player and i think i am pretty good at giving analysis and being able to break down these situations, especially when I'm not playing and I'm watching from the outside looking in. Um, but keep that in mind, this is to kind of help people maybe see the mistakes that they're missing and um, pick up on some new concepts if they haven't heard of them before. Um, I'll never dunk on anybody for making the wrong play in this series or anything like that. This is obviously educational, um, so don't think that these people, I'm making fun of them. It, it's not even going to be like a super jokey tone, like this is going to be a little bit more serious and things like that. Um, so I'm going to be going over everything what I think you did well, what I think you didn't do so well, and kind of the main reason for the way the game went. Um, I'm sure, and again, you can always post some wins too. Maybe it was a sloppy win. Maybe it was a really close game. You're like, man, what did I do to kind of let this derail a little bit for me? Remember, this is a series to kind of learn and grow from things. And um, I want this to be a cool outfit for people on um, this channel in general, for people to be able to watch and learn and grow and really um, start to experience how deep and fun the draft format can truly get um, the more and more you immerse yourself in it and the more and more you're willing to learn. So um, yeah, go ahead and check it out in the description below. Um, submit your replays. I would love to watch some of these. I'm only going to do like one or two a video just because I want to go super in depth with these. Um, but yeah, please, please go ahead and um, you know jump into it. But First off, we're going to be covering a game from Bruno7. Bruno actually uploads YouTube content. I know at least he did last gen. I'm not sure if he's uploading any leagues right now. Um, but he's a very solid player. He played in the CGT, um, has a good grasp of the game, and he submitted the game um, from a showdown league in Gen 8 Nat Dex, and we're going to be going over that today. So please forgive me as I am going to be kind of, you know, going in and out and in and out of a lot of these, uh, you know, different tabs and kind of adjusting it as I go. It's going to be a little bit more of a um, less edited and kind of just free flowing kind of content. Uh, now I have like kind of check these things out ahead of time and have my notes. Um, so we can kind of jump into it. So we see Bruno's team on the left. It consists of the Megalopony, Age Slash, Hydreigon, Rotom Heat, Sylveon, Mudsdale, Tentacruel, Archeops, Solosis, and Maractus, while his opponent's team is on the right, and it consists of the Garchomp, Tapu Koko, Corviknight, Chansey, Chandelure, Celebi, Wishiwashi, Coughing, Sneasel, and Hitmonchan. Now, from Bruno's side, he has a lot of really cool things going for him in this matchup offensively, in my opinion. Megalopony looks incredible. Um, really, the only thing that super stops it is, one, if he brings Coughing, which Coughing allows um, so many other things to thrive on Bruno's team, and it takes up a, moose slot from, or a team slot from something else. So I honestly think that's not that bad. And it's not a Pokemon that's known for its sustainability either. Um, so Coughing being there um, could deter it, but really it's going to be like Rocky Helmet and Rough Skin really chipping the, this thing down as the best way of kind of stopping it and slowing it down because other than that we have fighting resist tapu coco um, which isn't the sturdiest pokemon in the world and um is beaten and checked and forced in by a lot of things on bruno's team uh so i really think he can use it to his advantage in particular the, the momentum core of megalopony hydreigon and rotom heat is going to be really really incredible i think the top four are guaranteed to come right that lop ag hydra rotom um Three of those for those momentum means um, Hydra is gonna should perform you know some good speed control and again this is without looking at his team my thoughts that I wrote down before I looked at his team 
I would have loved a Choice Scarf Hydra in this matchup. Um, just because while it is stopped by a couple things, the things that it very telegraphically forces in are either things like Coco to take a bunch of chip, or you catch with an Earth Power, um, or something like Chansey if it comes, which I really don't think it comes in a matchup against AG um, Lop. Um, and other than that, it really is just the Coco and potentially the Corviknight. And again, forcing chip on Coco and Corvi means that your Lop comes in and picks two hit KOs the whole game. So that's really, really nice. It's also a Levitate user. Or, yeah, something off the ground that can avoid Garchomp Earthquakes, which we'll talk about. Garchomp's a big threat. Um, and then we have the Rotom, which is a great check to things like Coco. Soft checks the Garchomp, um, checks the heck out of Corviknight, which is a big nuisance for this team. Corviknight is incredibly obnoxious for this team, so anything it can do like that is going to be great. We soft check things like Celebi, even Chandelure to an extent. Wishy Washy, we can force out Sneasel. It has some great defensive application in this game. Because of that, though, and because of its liability to get really worn down, I think something like a Sylveon could be absolutely incredible with this team, really holding together this team and giving it a solid backbone, passing wishes into the road, and maybe even uh, throwing off a heal bell in case some, uh, you know, status gets thrown around and things like that, um, and getting some wishes out to its uh, opposing teammates and things of the sort to really, really help them thrive and uh, do well in this game. And then the last one, it's a toss-up between Mudsdale and Tentacruel. I don't think bottom place, bottom three really have a place in this matchup. Personally, I would go Tentacruel, because um, if coughing comes, I don't think it's going to be neutralizing gas, which means there's basically not a grounded poison on this team. And I think Lopany and Hydra and Rotom plus T-Spike up is almost unguardable and can really, 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 really bug this team. Like, bug it big time. Um, you do have things like Corviknight that can defog, but there's not really many safe instances for Corviknight to defog and if it does and if it takes that turn to defog you're gaining momentum in your own self so I think that T-Spike would be incredible on this team with this guy uh, just the combination of like sl a Scald, Sludge Bomb, Toxic Spikes and then like maybe like a knockoff or a Rapid Spin yourself but I really don't think Hazards are going to be up too much remember this is Gen 8 so there's no spikes on that Garchomp um, so I'm not super concerned about hazards, um, in my opinion. You could go knock off, you could go haze even if you're super scared of Garchomp sitting up on your face or something like that. If it's like a Yachi Berry variant or something like that. Um, so these are all, or you could even be Ice Beam if you weren't super scared about that and you feel like you could click those mid grounds. It also gives you a good check to the Shade of Lore, which you don't really have right now. Um, so I think that's nice. Mudsdale could also come because then you have rocks, um, which are obviously very important. And Mudsdale gives you another soft check to things like Garchomp, things like Coco. Um, and the ground resists aren't amazing. Uh, no, that's, see, that's wrong, though, because there's Corviknight and Celebi. So yeah, Mudsdale's a little bit passive defensively or offensively, but it has a good defensive role in this matchup. Now, as for the things that are really scary for Bruno, um, Garchomp, we kind of mentioned it before. I think that this thing has the opportunity to super steamroll and um, kind of snowball out of control in the mid to late game like early game i think he has solid checks to it right um he has things like lop that are faster um he has things like rotom and sylveon that threaten it out and live a hit and then mudsdale should check it decently but really if like rocks go up earthquakes are thrown around consistently and things like that like that mudsdale comes in takes an earthquake the next time it comes in it's really not a great guard chomp check anymore unfortunately and once that thing goes down an sd scale shot set can really really spiral out of control so he has to be careful um call mine coco could be a potential issue depending on the rotom set i would lean that he would kind of want to go toxic in this matchup just in case that you know coco gets really out of hand or at least it shuts down toxic variants you know like taunt variants and things like that will be you in that sense but um i don't think that like taunt cocos or like non-set of cocos are particularly threatening in this matchup uh, we mentioned the Corviknight being a really big nuisance for him um, offensively to try and break. So that's going to be a big, big issue outside of the Rotom, um, which, you know, is pressure to take hits from things like Coco, um, potentially. Uh, that can be really, really, really annoying. And then things like the Sneasel. Actually, Sneasel is a great breaker in this matchup, which is funny to say, but Triple Axel and Knock Off really break through uh, Bruno's team super, super well. So he's going to have to be very careful about how he positions around that. Okay. Next up, we have the Pokey Pace themselves, which is cool. So let's go ahead and go down right here. There we go. We can see that he is going with a power up punch Lopany, and I do think that this is a good idea. Um, again, he catches that Corviknight once with the CC or keeps it a little bit low. He's one power up punch in a close combat slash triple axle away from just killing everything on his opponent's team, which I think is a really, really awesome thing for him to potentially be able to do. Um, he has a Wish Spadef Sylveon. Now, I do think that Sylveon should have came, and it is like a Wish Protect variant, which is good. Um, Mystical Fire is a bit interesting just because of the fact that one, the Corvi can be mirror armor, um, and two, um, 
you're not really doing much to it in general, especially with such little special attack investment. I think he's much better off either going Baton Pass for Momentum if the League allows Dry Pass, um, but even if it doesn't, maybe like a Heal Bell could have been very beneficial for him or something of the sorts. I don't know. Uh, Mystical Fire could be nice in like a one-on-one -on -one situation if he's not a Mirror Armor variant, uh, which to be fair is a pretty uncommon thing in general. Um, but it's definitely a possibility in the Sylveon matchup where you know that its best way of hitting you is Mystical Fire, and uh, you're going to be lowering its special attack instead of your own. Citrus Berry Mudsdale is a cool idea. It allows it, um, you know, one more pivot into Garchomp, I believe, than it typically would have potentially if I know those calcs correctly. Um, and then Smackdown plus Earthquake is going to be really nice in deterring Corviknight from keeping away rocks very often. Because say you get up rocks, it comes into Defog, you smack down and you threaten it out with an Earthquake, you can get up your rocks again. Roar is great to deter setup and spread Hazard Chip on things. Um, he has the Hydreigon here, which is going to be Crunchy Scale Shot Earthquake Dragon. It's, and I actually think this is a really cool win con variant. Uh, but if you look at his team at plus one, this thing can absolutely rip through his opponent's team, provided he chips down that Corviknight. Um, it can do really, really well. So I think that's a really cool variant. Maybe <sighs> Scale Shot is cool, though. Um, I was saying maybe not Scale Shot, but then he's either forced into Outrage. Um, or like Dragon Rush, which isn't ideal. And Scale Shot, if he gets up a DD, we'll put him up to plus two speed, which will allow him to add speed to Scarf Garchomp if that is going to be what's coming against him. So that's nice. You see a Double Dance Age Slash? I am pretty interested as to see why he was Double Dance instead of SD3 attacks. I think that the Sneak um, option could have came up incredibly clutch, right? Um, into things like weakened Garchomps after they've set up and have had defense drops or weakened Cocos. Um, Chandelure, which this team does not have very good counterplay to, and things of the sort. I don't see many opportunities where he gets a Sword Stance and, a uh, and an Autotomize up and is really able to break the team the way he wants without taking a ridiculous amount of damage. Unless the opponent uses, like, passive means of checking Aegis Slash, like Chansey, which obviously isn't a very good idea in my opinion. Um, and then lastly, he has this road around here. You can't see it gets cut off. He's a pretty spadef. Volt switch overheat will was pain split. Like the pain split tech, um, just so that he can keep himself healthy. He's gonna spread burns and volt switch around. Again, that Coco can be a little bit of an issue for this team. His only Pokemon faster than it actually doesn't threaten it super hard offensively, um, especially if it's a bulkier Calm Mind variant. So I think bulky Calm Mind Coco versus this team and SD Scale Shot Chomp could be a real issue for the build in particular that Bruno ended up bringing. Next up, though, we have um, Bruno's opponent's team. Um, I totally forget his name. We'll see the showdown name at least in a second. Look, it says, it says Random Goodness. So, Random Goodness is team. Um, he is the SD Scale Shot um, Chomp, and I really like the Lum Tech. It really helps against things like Rotom, which can be a big issue. I'm going to go through his team much faster. Um, we do have AV Coco, which I felt was interesting. First, I, I, I do like the four attacks variant. Like, I don't think that he needed to be Calm Mind to do well, um, but I think like a U-turn over Volt Switch and then like a Heavy Duty Boots might have been a little bit more beneficial. I don't particularly see what <laughs> AV really helps with. Um, maybe something like Hydra? I don't know, but if you're Boots, you're always out of range of like an Earth Power or something like that. I don't know. He has a Mirror Armor Core of a Knight. Um, pretty mixed defensive with U-turn Iron Head Roost and Defog. No Brave Bird means that the lock can potentially um, 1v1 a little bit earlier, but again, Bruno doesn't know that, so he has to be very careful. A pretty spadef wishy-washy with a little bit of speed here, um, with just four attacks, Scald, Earthquake, U-Turn, and Ice Beam. I presume here to check the likes of... I'm trying to think what it's here to check. I'm not too familiar as to what it's really here to check. Um, this is definitely a really interesting bring. I figured maybe like a Fizzdef Fresh Talking Wishy Washy could come and like spread helmet chip on a bunch of things and you know check something like an Age Slash. Maybe it's mixed defenses to take on an Age Slash and just it has a natural Fizzdef. <sighs> I don't know. Then we have a Choice Scarf Shelby from him here. And this is another really, really interesting one, in my opinion, um, in the sense that I do think that Scarf is kind of cool and a good idea. However, this last Shadow Ball slot, I don't think it's great here. Um, now, obviously, it's here to hit the Age Slash, but I don't think that's a move that's very lockable and ever really going to be clicked in a matchup like this. I think I like the mid-ground Dazzling Gleam and, like, the face of a Lopunny a little bit better to catch that Hydreigon. Or I like the Healing Wish aspect to maybe break with um, Hydreigon, or not Hydreigon, Garchomp or Coco, and then bring them back a little bit later. And you'll see at the bottom, his um, last set is a Adamant Life Orb Sneasel. He's actually just dual stabs, uh, triple X and lock off Ice Shard Sword Stance, um, which again, does really, really well in this matchup. Okay, so first up we do have, or next up we do have the game itself. 
we're gonna go ahead and jump in. Now, I'm gonna be pausing a lot in this battle, just because, again, the whole point is replay analysis, and I'm not gonna rush through it. Um, so if you don't like that it take a little bit longer on this, sorry. <laughs> um, but we're gonna see um, the teams right here. We don't really have to go over matchup because we've already seen what happens. We can kind of just jump right into it. So. We're gonna have a Celebi lead and a Rotom lead. This is a great lead for Bruno. Um, I actually think that the Rotom lead was pretty darn safe. Um, he has early pivots and a Chomp if he doesn't want to take that Stone Edge or that Dragon Claw or you know take damage to get that Willow off. Obviously, he doesn't know if he's long or not, but you know he has the pivots around it right now in Mudsdale in Sylveon, and it really does kind of lead well into everything else on Bruno's or on his opponent's team. Um, the opponent leads off with Celebi, so because it's a Scarf, you would expect a potential U-turn to come out or something of the sorts, but he's actually going to make a super, super over-aggressive play and Psychic here. Now, Bruno's going to Volt Switch right here, which is his best play, because one, he doesn't need to predict his opponent over-predicting and over-playing this early. Um, he can still come back in later. He can either receive a Wish from Sylveon or get a Pain Split back um, on really the entire rest of the team that is full. And now he's able to grab a little bit of momentum and put himself in a good position here. As Sylveon is going to be able to come out. <sighs> Sorry, I might even have to pause because... I yawn a lot. I think we're only going to do one video, or one battle per video, at least for right now. We'll see. Uh, maybe in future videos I'll go a little bit faster, but um, I really want to give these videos the time that they, and like the, the battles, the focus that they deserve. And Sylveon's going to come out right here, and I believe we are going to see um, a double in a Rotom. Now, this double is definitely um, pretty a pretty solid play, because um, in the sense you would think he would want to wish here and pass into his Rotom, but what this does is it allows him to gain momentum back on his own side, right? Because he can potentially threaten, um, or get back to essentially full with a pain split on everything on this team, right? Maybe besides Celebi, but even then, um, go hard Celebi on your when you're in with Pokemon that's weak to fire. Uh, but you can also get a potential free Wisp off on something. And again, Celebi's not coming in here. Nothing on this team wants to take a burn. Nothing on this team wants to take a burn. So, well, initially, I kind of thought that the double wasn't, you know, super needed. In the sense that he could always wish and pass on this. This allows him to not lose momentum and lose that um, initiative to the Corviknight. So this is a great way to swing it back at his momentum. He is going to go Coco right here. Um, Bruno's opponent, random goodness here. He's gonna take this with, so that's a good mid ground from um, random goodness right here. Not going into his chomp and getting too aggressive too early, recognizing that it's probably his best way of winning this game later on, and um, getting into a Pokemon that's kind of here to check and pivot into things like this and really, really chip it down. Now, this is gonna give Bruno an opportunity though, after Nature's Madness, to pain split off a ton of health and get back up, you know, basically to the same amount, really chipping this Coco down, getting it to about 60. Remember, this isn't Boots, um, this isn't Bruce, this is Assault Vest, so the damage this thing takes is permanent. There's no Healing Wish on the Celebi, there's nothing to get this thing back to the range in which it was before. So I think that's a really, really clutch aspect of this guy right here. Um, he is going to make the pivot out to Sylveon right here. As yet another major Nature's Madness is uh, going to come out, um, and he's going to click Protect this next turn. I feel like Wish was pretty safe. It also covered him taunting, potentially, um, but again, uh, and getting a little bit of leftovers back. But as, you know, Random Goodness Volt switches and, uh, you know, Bruno protects, he's going to throw up a Wish this next turn, and Random Goodness is going to make a double. I think that this double was expecting the Mudsdale to come in on the Fault Switch, showing that he wasn't U-turn and things like that, and trying to take advantage of him. But Bruno's going to make a smart play and just wish up, recognizing that he needs to keep this healthy, and he needs to keep the Rotom healthy. This thing needs to stay healthy as a nice soft check to something like Garchomp, as a wall to the Coco that has shown to not be Taunt. Um, and again, a soft check to the Garchomp, and the only thing stopping it from scale shotting through this entire team. So um, I think that's a really clutch aspect of it right here. He's gonna just hyper voice on the wishy, knowing that it doesn't really do anything that immediately threatens the Sylveon out. And he's gonna get back up to full on this Corviknight. This next turn, he's gonna take a big Iron Head to the face, and I don't think that this was the correct play. I understand um, we don't wanna lose momentum to the Corviknight. Kinda of talked about it earlier, right? Um, we made a double to ensure that it couldn't you turn around forever and put him in a bad spot. But again, like I said, the Sylveon is very important. This is really one of the only things stopping that Garchomp from winning the game later on. Again, I know we have Mudsdale, but once Mudsdale's chipped and gone, which is a lot easier to chip down than a Sylveon, that thing's going to be an issue. And taking a ton of damage on Sylveon for no reason just doesn't seem super beneficial just to throw up a Wish in the air to try and pass into your um, Brodom. 
I don't know. Maybe even just protecting initially since bulk up really isn't a big threat to you when you have a Rotom Heat. Uh, might have been a little bit advantageous. Might have been a bit advantageous as well. Um, just to be able to uh, scout and see what he wanted to go for. And maybe even see if he's trying to be over aggressive there. And you at least get your leftovers recovery and things like that. So we do get the wish off and we don't get fun. So there wasn't a big punish there. But again, very, very scary in my opinion. He's going to protect here on a U-turn. Get back up to essentially full. So he's doing just fine again, thankfully. And he does make the correct play this time. Going out into the Rotom on the U-turn. So again, we are giving up momentum, which is a bit scary. Garchomp comes in right here. And Rotom can make the play of staying in Wisping on this thing but if he goes for a stone edge he dies um if he goes for an outrage he probably dies because he's not super fizz def plus he doesn't know if he's a lum or not and if he is that lum variant you basically just threw away your rotom for nothing um for absolutely nothing in fact so there's no reason to not go mudsdale right now when he has it so healthy but this is what i'm kind of talking about well mudsdale again checks garchomp and switches into it well this earthquake is going to do 31%. And it doesn't seem like that much. Like, man, he's got a citrus berry. He can switch into that again and be okay. Like, it's not that big of a deal. But really, it is. Because as this thing comes in next time, if this chomp gets up a sword stance, it's a potential roll to kill him depending on how these go. And if not, it's not like the Mudsdale can kill him in one. He can potentially like EQ into scale shot and win the game in that sense. So there's a lot of really scary things that can kind of occur with this Garchomp. Um, especially being that this Sylveon is Spadef. It's not going to take plus two EQs. <laughs> like this thing's going to be really, really scary. So if it gets off that SD scale shot, things are looking incredibly tough for Bruno. He's going to have to position very offensively around this Garchomp and really make sure he positions himself well. The next turn, I believe he is going to elect to get up his rocks, which is a good aggressive rocks. He loves another earthquake, so even if he stayed in there, he's just about fine. He gets up the rocks um, on the Corviknight coming in, too. And now you might think, like, okay, well, Corvi's just going to come in, and it's just going to defog away the rocks anyway, so what's the point? The point is, by forcing that Corviknight to defog, what Bruno was able to do was swing momentum back in his favor by forcing that defog. Now, if random goodness wants to u-turn out to maintain offensive initiative and momentum that's fine he can do so right and he keeps that offensive initiative for sure but that means rocks are up for the time being at some point in time unless he wants rocks up the entire game he's going to have to lose a little bit of um tempo and initiative in order to defog away those rocks um so this is a good way for bruno to kind of set the pace again in his own favor um which i do think is very very smart Next up, we are going to see the Wishy-Washy come out, and this is really interesting. I'm not sure if he expected an Overheat or a Will-O-Wisp or something of the sorts, uh, but Bruno is just going to Volt Switch out and do a good 37 to this thing, really chipping it down, down to 34%, which is great for Bruno. Um, and since, another thing that's... Um, Oh no, sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Since we get in our lock, we can go ahead and just mega off and throw off a big close combat. There's not really a resist at this point. This is almost a KO at this point, uh, especially with the Coco being at 47. It just dies to two, obviously. But we're going to see the Corviknight come in. It's going to take about 39%, showing it's pretty darn physically defensive, right? I believe, yeah. He's almost max fist death, but pretty darn physically defensive. Um... It's going to come in right here, it's going to take some chip, and it's going to show the Rocky Helmet, which is um, a bit unfortunate, but he at least gains that knowledge and that information. He's going to be able to get out into Rotom, and what this Corviknight is put in a position is, again, do I want to keep my Corviknight healthy, or do I want to gain momentum? And you're going to see Random Goodness is actually going to elect the latter and go ahead and go for a U-turn, trying to swing things back in his favor, which is good for him, and I understand that play. But another thing it does is it means that when this lock comes in, it has the potential to just pick a KO every time. Now, I understand Celebi can come in, but it is an offensive Celebi, and it risks coming in on a U-turn and getting blown the fuck up. Like, really, really blown up. So that's a really, or even a triple axle and getting blown the fuck up. So um, him not roosting here is going to position that lock in position for basically a knockout next time it comes in. Garchomp's going to come out. We do see the Mudsdale, and he makes good play. He swords dances. Um, this is very, very drawback free for him. He is going to be that Lum variant, so if he wanted to Wisp there and stay in and punish the swords dance, he wasn't really punishing it, and then he could just knock him out with a plus two Dragon Claw that turn next turn instead of risking a Stone Edge, which would have been incredible. And what this is going to do is going to put that Mudsdale in a tough spot because even if plus two EQ doesn't kill, he doesn't really do much back offensively, um, and he can potentially even scale shot off the next turn and actually just kill every Pokemon on the team damn near. Um, so that looks really scary for him right now. He is just going to EQ. Mudsdale does live because he's just a chunky dude. Uh, he gets his Citrus Berry back, but he's still in range of Earthquake next time as he's forced to roar out the um, Garchomp, and then Sneasel is going to come in, which is incredibly unlucky because this, again... 
forces that Mudsdale to go out, go down. Now, it would have been really hard to wish it up. I think he still could have at 30% with Sylveon forcing in the Corviknight and then um, switching out into the Mudsdale. Being that the Sneasel came in, he was able to force that progress for himself now. Now, that Karchomp looks immensely threatening. If it gets up both that Swords Dance and that Scale Shot, it can win. And also, if it just gets Chip on Sylveon, uh -huh, it can win with just a Scale Shot up even. So, there's a lot of really scary things. We do get to see that Sneasel item right here. It is Life Orb, which means this is a pretty free lock right here. And honestly, it should be a free close combat kill as he is going to switch out into the wishy-washy um, as Bruno is going to throw off a U-turn. Now, I understand probably thinking like this is when he brings in the aggressive Celebi, um, but realistically, attack where your opponent can't defend. Your opponent just doesn't have a switch into close combat plus U-turn or, or just megalopony in general. Um, and um, it, it really, really just does not have the switch in. Plus, that U-turn is pretty um, free on the Sneasel as well, you know, potentially knocking it out and things like that. Um, you might as well close combat right here uh, and take it out because you're going to be able to uh, have your lop in, which is faster than everything, uh, minus a Celebi, which you can kind of scout and see that a Scarf now. Instead, you're going to go down your Sylveon and potentially lose momentum on your side again. And Sylveon coming in is a little bit more manageable for random goodness to kind of gain that offensive initiative here. As you're going to see, that Corviknight is going to come out, and this is going to give it that turn to Roost that it kind of needed in order to you know, check that Lopany. So now your Lopany doesn't claim a KO every time it comes in, unfortunately, because that Corviknight was given that opportunity to Roost. He's going to go, uh, Bruno's going to go here into his Aegis Slash, and this was a very interesting play to me, right? Because the fact that we did still have the Rotom, and we do still have that potential Pain Split Opportunity Slash Momentum Grabbing option, um, whereas his Aegis Slash doesn't necessarily win yet, and it doesn't necessarily beat this thing yet. One, it could be, um, no, it can't be Payback. Um, but, especially being that we saw Helmet, and we know the things that are potentially in the back right here, um, I'm not too sure if I agree with going into Aegis here over that Rotom, which seemed to give us a little bit more initiative. Um, this is another reason why I think Sneak could have been really clutch here. So, Roost is going to come out as he throws off a big, big Sword Stance, and U-Turn is going to come out as Draft League player does click U-Turn, grab him a little bit of momentum. He is going to be able to potentially take this trade with the Sneeze right here, um, but honestly, I feel like this is a fine trade for random goodness. He doesn't really deal with AG in the end game, especially if Lop is able to pressure and chip down that Corviknight, whereas he can do a ridiculous amount with Knock Off right here not quite knock it out but he either has to attack right here and knock out the sneasel which is the play that he should do if he is going to elect to stand or if he autonomizes for some reason uh he is going to be able to um play around it accordingly as you're going to see bruno does elect to autonomize and i'm not a big fan of this play because one um this thing's a big threat to you, right? It actually has a potential to a key or oko your entire team at the moment so if you're going to stay in and you're like i live a hit take the KO at that point, right? I really, really think that you should take the KO. Um, but being that you didn't here, he can kind of switch and pivot around this. And as you're going to see, he makes a very, very solid play here. And he is going to go into his Corviknight, which is Rocky Helmet, like we said. And this just doesn't kill it yet. Now, you do force chip for your Lopunny, but it's actually still not in range. Um, but it is at least like, you know, a 2 KO range or power up punch into close combat definitely kills now too. So that's really good at least. But the Aegis Slash resource was kind of burned at this point. And I don't know if it was the time to burn it because it really did have end game potential. If you just chip down the Garchomp a little bit and chip down this Corviknight, it really could find that position potentially on something like a Celebi or even a Coco and um, set up and win the game. So that's really, really tough for me um, to, you know, see right there. Corviknight is going to be in on this rotor right here as a Volt Switch is pretty darn free in my opinion. Our, an Overheat comes out. Um, I actually forgot that happened and it caught me super off guard. Now, this was a very, very big, big misstep from uh, Random Goodness because he's already super lock weak. We have acknowledged that. In range, in range, in range, in range. Like these Pokemon all can potentially die, especially if he doesn't get that Corviknight roost off and a power punch goes off. His Celebi was the only Pokemon stopping him from, like, losing to that Lop 100% of the time because he was a Scarf Psychic set, uh, being able to come in and revenge that thing. So going into that Celebi on a really aggressive overheat, thinking either a Willow or a Volt comes out, just isn't the play in my opinion. I think you have to burn that resource in Coco. Um, if it's like a Scarf Hydra, it beats you at this point anyways. Um, I think what you can do is you can go into Coco, you eat up a hit, you might throw off um, a Nature's Madness, you might even Volt, uh, you can't really Volt at that point either. 
or something of the sorts, or even going Garchomp and being willing to burn that Lumberry, as this is really the only thing that is going to, um, you know, get you with a status move, and uh, keeping that Celebi in the back seems incredibly, incredibly important. So, this was a big misstep by uh, Bruno's opponent, in my opinion. I think this play was um, a little bit over-aggressive and not needed in the slightest, in my opinion. But it's definitely not like I, I lose the game right now play. We are going to see the Garchomp come out in this next turn, as a scale shot is going to come off. This is a good aggressive Sylveon right here, recognizing that if this thing Swords Dance into Scale Shot, I can lose the game, so I need to be careful around it. Even if it SDs here, I don't think it Oko Sylveon necessarily, and even if it does, at least you can kind of delay it a little bit and get into your Lopunny and force it out with a Triple Axel or kill it with a Triple Axel. So that's a really, really important turn right there, being able to catch that thing. We are going to see the Corviknight come in, and I think that he needed to keep up the aggressive play and get the double off, um, either into, yeah, probably into Rotom, or even into Hydra to try and set up some DBs and keep this thing chipped down, but really, mostly the Rotom, because this thing coming in for free is going to mean that it does get off that Roost, and it makes that power up punch close combat and game a little bit harder. Now at 80, I don't think it dies to pop into plus one CC, unfortunately. Um, so that's going to be a big, big downside here, as we are going to see an overheat come out into this Garchomp, and it's going to take a little bit of chip here as a sword stance does pop. We see a pain split right here. Um, but it, honest to God, just might be a little bit too little, too late right here. 69% is going to come back. We see the Sylveon come out as a Stone Edge is going to pop. I understand why he made this play, right? He couldn't let it scale shot right here. He just simply could not let it scale shot right here or the game was over. But now that the Sylveon has taken 89% and dies to everything on this team and never has an opportunity to wish itself up, um, it's it's kind of, again, delaying that inevitable because he's going to be able to click that very free Earthquake. There's no reason to save this and risk something else. And while Lop can come out right here, he has a very safe Coco Sack, which I definitely agree with. I think that this Coco Sack was 100% the right move. Um, and then he's going to force in that Corviknight this next turn. And while this Corviknight doesn't knock him out necessarily, um, oh, that's a super aggressive play. Um, but I understand it. No, no, it's not an aggressive play because he can always U-turn out and then go into the, like Sneasel. And again, he, he's fine because what this does is um, he's going to chip himself down a ton, right? He super, super chips himself down by attacking in this thing. Sneasel's going to come out and that uh, Corvi is going to come back out again, take a close combat, get crit and knocked out. Um, I am surprised that we didn't see another power up punch here into the Sneasel as that might have been enough to potentially win the game. I'm not sure on the calc, so I'll have to look at them afterwards. Um, or maybe Bruno can say something in the comments or something like that. Because if he pl power punched again and took two turns of Rocky, would have been wouldn't have been better than minus two defense here from close combat. Regardless, um, this is a this is a pretty tough position right here, right? Because Sneasel is going to come out, and it does revenge with Ice Shard from here. And I'm actually curious what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to the cow. We're definitely only doing one game today, by the way, guys. Uh, we're gonna go to Mega Lopany. Sorry, I gotta look at this because I'm curious. Because if I'm envisioning this end game the way I think it should be, let's go Sneasel. Let's go Sword Dance, Adamant, Life Orb, Ice Shard to a Mega Lopany with 40 HP. 40 HP. So, what I'm wondering is if he comes back in 37, he lives this next ice shard. Okay. So then here's Bruno's end game, right? At least in my opinion, I could be just smoking on gas, but this should be his end game. What he should do is he should always go into Hydreigon here. I understand Hydreigon dies, but Hydreigon loses to both of these Pokemon, right? It lets the Karchomp scale shot up, um, and obviously it can avoid you know, certain amount of scale shot hits and potentially win the game that way. Uh, but that's not the most reliable means. And same thing with Sneasel, like it can miss Axel. But again, not the most reliable means of winning. What he can do is he can go out into the Hydreigon, right? He can go ahead, sack it off, bring back in this Lopunny and just click close combat twice, right? Because he can close combat in on the Chomp coming in. I believe Garchomp does die from 58. Check. Uh, we have close combat. Um, oh, it doesn't. So he might even have to power punch. But even then, it's fine, right? Because he can close combat two times if he doesn't kill, um, which he doesn't from that range. 
in close combat two times from neutral kill this thing sneasel comes back in and it's not going to be allowed to sword sense or anything like that you can close combat and sack yourself off go into your rotom win the game with overheat potentially but what he's going to do right here is he's actually going to elect to go into the rotom here as an ice shard is popped now if you want to make the pivot into hydra now that's fine but what's going to happen is he's going to get knocked off right and he is going to you know 1v1 the sneasel or at least burn it or something of the sorts right but now recognizing he has his opportunity he's going to get into that um, guard chomp here and throw off that scale shot and because this guard chomp was given an opportunity to come in when lopany wasn't in it's able to scale shot up and there's not much counterplay to it at this point other than dodging it or getting a low amount of hits there's really not much you could do i think this is a very smart play by random goodness recognizing okay my sneeze was low um I'm okay with letting myself go down or going hard guard chomp again. He still has his lum, so he didn't have to worry about wisp. He didn't die to overheat from there. He was at like 50% or something of the sorts, right? Let's see. Yep, he goes guard chomp, 58%. So there's no shot in any universe where even crit overheat killed him. And then he's going to be able to throw off a very free scale shot. And um, he had that kind of hope for a miss there, I think. Um, as an overheat pops, he does miss the overheat. And this was pretty big. I think potentially, depending on Rotom. I think the Rotom was no investment, right? We're gonna see no investment, yeah. So no investment actually didn't kill. Um, he did have the opportunity to crit. It's 16 special attack, but even then I don't think that's enough. He did have the opportunity to crit, which is definitely a big thing, right? If he hits, he has that opportunity to crit, but since he didn't, he's gonna be able to scale shot up again. But that second scale shot, again, it really doesn't matter because this is not fake out lob and it's not quick attack. So this means that he does just lose to this thing, unfortunately, if this thing gets more than um, three hits, which you're going to see, it does get four and it knocks off the Hydra. So I don't think that Bruno played bad in this game, and I, I think he knows that, obviously, and he sent it. It was really just a matter of positioning around this guard chomp. And I think if he slowed down and saw that endgame scenario, which is, again, very much so easier said than done. Um, me from the outside looking in, seeing what Bruno's doing, um, opposed to being in the game and not trying to choke and, you know, trying to, you know, play eight different endgame scenarios in your head. And what if he's this? What if he's this? What if he does this? It's, it's a completely different world. But from my outside perspective, he had that end game, right? Provided he slows down just a little bit here and sacks the Hydreigon instead. Um, because then he can come back in with his Lopany. He lives the Ice Shard from there. And he can just go ahead and throw off a close combat. Um, or even throw off a Power Punch if he wants to do so. Um, power Punch actually totally works as well. Because he can Power Punch into close combat. And again, it, it works the same exact way. So I think that... Um, that was just like the main thing kind of holding Bruno back here was just the wrong sack in the end game and keeping the wrong piece around um, and uh, just not us utilizing those Pokemon and his resources to the highest ability. But it was a very close game. Um, it was a 2-0, but it, again, it was incredibly, incredibly close. Um, I think his opponent played very well. I think they both had some instances where they were a bit over aggressive, but not the biggest deal in the world. Um, and yeah, it's just, uh, this, I think this is a really good first battle to kind of show off how uh, just one one tiny turn can really just change the entire end result of a battle. Um, and that's what kind of happened here, unfortunately. So um, good game to both players, though. And again, I really appreciate Bruno for showing me this game and sending it in. If you guys want to send in some replays right here, I would appreciate it a ton. And in, uh, in all honesty, uh, I, I think this is a really cool series idea. Big shout out to JCM, shout out for giving me the idea. And big shout out to CB Marcus, who also had the same idea, and I didn't know it <laughs> going into when I tweeted about this. Um, I submitted one of my own personal replays to him if he's going to be doing this as well. Hopefully, we'll get to see my game um, analyzed. It was my Crash Week one, uh, which isn't a league that I'm uploading, but I ended up losing that game. And um, I'm sure that Marcus will have some, you know, good good analysis for me and you know ways that i can improve myself because he's a great player as well uh, i'm gonna link bruno down in the description below I, again like i said he uploaded last gen i don't know if he is this gem but i know he at least did last gen he's a very solid player um and yeah again i appreciate it guys thank you guys so much for watching please go down there submit your games draft league games that aren't complete blowouts at least blowouts in your favor if you want me to you know look at a blowout against you i can definitely do so it might be a little bit quicker of an analysis than this 40 minute one uh but i think i'm gonna actually stick to one battle per video now which means i might not get to everybody and i might not do them super fast but um yeah thank you guys so much um i'll see you guys in the next one let me know what you guys think later